Okay, guys, we're going to get started on a uh, lecture on Chapter 8, which will include uh, hopefully a, a fair amount of a code along uh, example. And so, Chapter 8 is um, uh, how to transfer data from controllers. And so, as we're kind of getting used to this, we've got the back end, aka the model, we've got the middle tier, which are our controllers, then we've got the front end, which is the view. And so we're, we're sending data kind of from the middle tier to the front end. And someone's got to mute themselves. Thanks, whoever found themselves. Um, if we think back to the JavaScript days, before we even touched the front end, we did a lot with RESTful APIs, which were really just the back end mixed with the middle tier, right? Pulling data out of the back end or wherever we were getting our data from and sending it in the form of JSON to, um, to the front end, which we used Postman, right? So, so we did a lot of this even before we touched a front end um, of just working with data and sending it to a front end and that's exactly what this is we're going to learn some different ways uh, to send data to the front end of course one thing that we have already used is view bag and view data um, and so we dive just a little bit deeper into these different properties and how they work um, and then there's this new um, thing called a view model or a VM, right? View model, um, where right now, if we think about the data that we're displaying on our front end, the data aligns perfectly with our models, right? Our models like a customer or a product or an individual entity. But a lot of times the front end website might not align up perfectly with a model. In other words, you might want to join some different data together from, from a model. And we've kind of, we've done that too, right? Where we've, we've actually had a front end that was a join uh, together of data. Um, and we use this view bag and view data to kind of handle that extra data that was outside of the model. Um, but, there's a case to be made for this thing called a view model um, that's a C-sharp class that essentially selects all of our data and um, is a workaround for, for not using view bag and view data. And kind of the benefit of using this over using that is that this comes with IntelliSense. And so with IntelliSense, you get compile time um, errors like your errors are going to error out at compile time when you're coding your application versus view bag and view data you don't get IntelliSense you just have to type it and if it crashes it crashes at runtime so as a developer if you're faced with the options of like would you rather your code break when you're writing it or would you rather your code break when you're running it of course most of us would choose, I'd rather it be a compiler error as opposed to a runtime error. And so, again, using view bag and view data, you know, uh, I'm thinking of, you know, our products had a category and there was a products table and there was a category table. And so if we were displaying a product, we would display the category data along with it and we would load the category data up in view bag or view data and it just works a little bit differently with this view model thing. So I'm gonna break this up into like two parts, today and tomorrow. So today we're not actually gonna even get here to this view model thing, but, but we'll get there tomorrow. Um, and then as well as working with um, uh, this temp data property, which is also new to us. So definitely some things as been the case, we're gonna review some things that we've done before, as well as introduce some new things. Um, and so, again, we're kind of focusing on the controllers and controllers sending data to the view. And so, right now, um, 
if I were to go into one of our old labs, um, our controllers, if I'm remembering right, and, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but our controllers have a return data type of I action result. Does that ring a bell? Yeah. I action result. And you gotta go back to your C-sharp days and you gotta understand, first off, what is an interface? What is inheritance? To really understand why this kind of works. So I'm gonna start with the theory kind of back from the C-sharp days to explain what is an interface, what is an abstract class, and what is inheritance, right? Because understanding these different pieces will understand, will help you to understand why our code is working the way it is working. Um, so the way I think of an interface to start, I think of an interface as a list of methods that you want to enforce on a class. So if you have a behavior that you want your class to implement, if you want a method that you say, hey, I want to make sure that my class implements this method, that's where interfaces come in. Interfaces are basically templates of methods. And when you implement an interface, you're forcing your class to, to use those methods or, or basically create an implementation of those methods. So, so this hierarchy, if you kind of start with the interface, um, there's one class here and this class implements an interface. So the class is called action result. And it's safe to say that anything that inherits from action result um, can be returned out of our controller. So all of these classes down here, this view result, redirection, all of these are classes in C Sharp. They all inherit from one parent. That parent is action result that action result class implements the interface i action result and that's that's the hierarchy that we're looking at so the reason you can return i action result out of our controllers is it's basically says any class that implements this interface that class is a valid return type out of our controller so when you say that this controller returns anything that implements this interface is basically the way it works. Well, this class implements the interface and all of these classes inherit from that class. Therefore, all that just to say, all of these classes, view result, re, re, uh, redirect result, JSON result, and file result, these are all valid return types out of our controllers. All that's just to say, our controller can send back all these kinds of data. What we've been sending back is basically HTML mixed with C Sharp, AKA that razor syntax, that is this view result. For the most part, our controllers have been returning this HTML and C Sharp hybrid that is a view result. This chapter gets into a point where our controllers will actually do some redirection. I know we've done that a couple of times where our controllers have actually, instead of returning HTML to the browser, it redirects you to another uh, uh, action method and that action method returns HTML. Uh, here's JSON. Right. The reason I bring up last semester is last semester we were sending back a lot of JSON, right? And and by sending back a JSON result object, you could do the same thing in C Sharp, right? Read data out of a database, send that JSON result to the front end uh, to be parsed by whatever's in the front end. Vinny, did I answer your question? Uh, I was just curious. So like we. Bingo, bingo, yes. Okay. Yes, you can. And so your return data type, mm -hmm. and the book makes this case, you should. You actually should. If you understand what your controller is returning, you should for two reasons. Number one, at runtime, the, you know, 
MVC, basically the server, is going to have to determine what your return type actually is. And so it's basically going to have to convert this I action result into one of these objects anyways. So for performance reasons, that is actually slightly more efficient to return the actual type. And the other thing is it's, it's slightly more readable. Like you know exactly what kind of object your method is returning. So for those two reasons, um, it's actually recommended to return one of these objects directly instead of the generic interface I action results. Okay, now it's easier to just say, I don't know what it's gonna return, return I action result, and then it still works, but best practice would be to do just that. Um, another thing along the way that, and I don't know that now's the time to hit on it, but when you say like return, when you say return view, um, that's just a method call that returns a view result object. So when you say return view in your controller, that method call ultimately creates one of these view result objects for you and returns that object type, right? That was confusing to me. And if you kind of like were going to rewind all of my lectures, I even admitted that before. I was a little confused because it would say, it returns a view result object, but in the in the C sharp code, it would just say return view. Well, a view is not a view result, right? But in fact, all that is is a method call called a, you know return view, and it's a method call. And in that method call, it returns this object of view result. So, um, A lot of what we're doing is just returning a view result. We will do some of this redirection stuff this chapter, a little bit more with that, <coughs> even though I know we've done that before. Uh, you can return JSON, again, just because I know we're comfortable with that. When I say return, this is going from the server, returning it to the browser, right? So that's where this data is going. It's going to the front end. You could return files and status codes. We're not really gonna do so much with this. But, you know, they give you a list of all the different things, all the different types of data, if you will, that your controllers could return to the front end. So again, when you say return view, when you say return view, it's in fact returning a view result object. And I would have expected this to say return root like that. Okay, why? Well, that's a constructor call. And that would make sense in my mind. But ultimately, what, what you just have to, what I envision, if, if I'm looking at this method, somewhere in there, this you're calling this function called view, and that method ultimately returns a view result object that ultimately, what is a view result? Well, it's going to be some HTML mixed with your C sharp that's going out the door. So that razor syntax that we've been learning about. So um, the object types are here, but you return those object types by calling these various methods. So return a view, that's most common. We will talk about different ways to redirect, file, and of course, JSON. Now, any one of these is gonna have a bunch of overloads, right? And we've kind of, dabbled with these different overloads. So, um, no arguments, one argument, which is your data, AKA your model. Uh, if you want to return to a different, um, uh, instead of returning to the index method of the home controller, you could return to a different front end view, right? Instead of returning index, you could say, hey, go to the edit view or whatever, right? So you can change the name of the view and of course change the name of the view and the model. Uh, so what does this boil down to? These are all overloads of this one view method that we've seen. Um, here's an example of just that. So here we're returning a view and we've changed our return data type to view result instead of the interface 
eye action result, right? Again, better for a couple of reasons, performance and readability. Um, again, doing the same thing here. This is a redirect to action. The class is redirect to action result, um, which isn't actually listed here. But there's another one, redirect to action result. Do you have any? So under view result, you're returning a view. So is view result different than view? Uh, yes. That's I was, yeah. I was, I was trying to. I was trying to mentioned that a little bit earlier that I would almost expect this to say view result yeah. right here because then the data types match. Mm -hmm. But what's happening behind the scenes is that this view method ultimately will return a view result object. Gotcha. So it's kind of some it's kind of happening behind the scenes. I, I almost wish it was the same identifier, which is what you're saying. Um but really, all this is is returning different return data types out of our controller actions. Um, yes, sir. So those are all still actions, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, these are all action methods, as they call them. Yeah. So are you using your tag helper? Your tag helper will still be the same with the HP action edit? Yeah. That's right. Okay, so um, if you've been paying close attention along the way, you've seen these properties, be it view data and view bag, right? So if I just kind of like slide number eight, obviously we're looking at this thing called view data. And if I jump ahead, we're done talking about view data. On slide 13, we talk about view bag. Um, it it kind of boils down to this. Um, they can be used interchangeably. There's slight differences between view data and view bag, but they're both used for the same purpose, which is to take data from your controller, from the controller, and make that available to a view. And so getting data that isn't sent over from the model because as you know you could send data from a model to a to a view as is demonstrated here here's data being sent from a model and we're sending this they're sending this data to the view but if you're not sending it in this return statement if you're not sending the data in the return statement that's where you can load up data in this view data property or view bag it boils down to, I, I try to try and keep it high level. View bag is a little bit easier to work with. And so because view bag is easier to work with, most people just want to work with view bag. Um, the reason why view bag is easier to work with is view data behind the scenes is actually a dictionary, right? And you guys did a lab with C sharp dictionaries. We, we, I literally did a coding example, I think, last week using a dictionary. Um, but dictionaries work with these like key and value pairs. And so when we're loading this up, it, it, it's not too hard. The, the, the key would be the book and the value would be Alice in Wonderland. And that's your first piece of view data. So like sub zero, if you will. View data sub zero would have this key and this value. View data here is this key price and the value of 999. Um, and so you would say that the count of view data here is two. So there's a property, right? The keys would be book and price. So there's a, um, again, it's, it's a dictionary behind the scenes. So you can work with view data you can work with view bag view bags just a little bit easier to work with because in general dictionaries were less uh experience with dictionaries right um it's also notes the book notes that very technically speaking a view bag property is part of view data 
to just make it even more confusing, but that that in fact view bag is part of view data. But this syntax, if we're just looking at if we're just looking at this, right, view bag, we're no longer using an array syntax, which is essentially how you put data into the dictionary. We're just using this dot notation. Right? So just again looking at the input of our data, right? View data sub book or view bag dot book. Well, clearly putting data in, I think most people would prefer the syntax. They can be used interchangeably almost 100% of the time. Okay, so for most cases, just use view bag. The syntax is easier. Now, when it comes to pulling data out, because this is a dictionary, we're going to loop through. And if you've ever looped through a dictionary before, there you say, you know, for each key value pair, the, the, the string is the key, right? The value is an object data type, a nullable object data type called item. So item dot key will give you the key of book item dot value would give you Alice in Wonderland, right? So putting data, I guess my point is putting data into view data is a slightly more complex syntax. Pulling data out of view data is also a slightly more complex syntax. You have any? The item would be, yeah, so the, the sub-zero item mm -hmm. would be, the key would be book, and then the value would be Alice in Wonderland. Uh, so, like, how, how, is it just determined in the order that they're created? That's right. Okay. Yeah, and since we're creating this one first, that's going to be your sub-zero, essentially, the yeah. first one. Yeah. Yep. There's a... Yes. Precisely. Because view bag is a piece of is a part of view data that works. So then on this slide here, why why <laughs> you say view data dot or uh, I'm kinda of confused on why you can put it into view or never mind. It's confusing. Yeah. It's confusing. Um Yep. We do this view data title uh, equals title. Could, is it possible to do view bag dot title equals title in that case? Is that what you're trying to do? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you could. Um, okay. Now. If we're looping over our view data, right? So again, this is, what is this? This is razor code. Obviously razor codes in our view. We have a for each loop looping over our view data property is what it's called. Okay, so um, I just see what Vinny's typing. That's to loop over all of the items in view data. Well, this next slide doesn't loop over all of the data. This is just literally pulling a single piece out. And looking at this slide versus this slide, okay? So here's an H4 price. We're pulling out the price key, right, which holds 999 and converting that to a string. Now, this slide does the same thing. We're pulling out a single piece of data out of view data, but notice they basically have this, what's called the null coalescing operator, the single question mark, because why? Well, if your view data doesn't have a price, then calling a two-string method on it would crash it. 
if you guys remember a few weeks ago, or last week even, Jeff Scott kind of got on the big screen, and he was calling a two-string on a variable that didn't have a value, right? And that was crashing his program. So the way this question mark works is it says, hey, this question mark right here says, don't call to string unless there is a price stored inside of view data. Well, let's go back to how we put that in. How did we put that into view data? Here, 999 was put in. All right, this the, following me through the woods on this one, like I've spent, I spent 15 minutes trying to make sure I understand this. 999 is what? 999 is a double. Keep in mind, when, when you do something like this, double val equals 9.99. You've got a data type on the left, which is double. You also have an assumed data type on the right, which is double. And this works because you got a double on the left and a double on the right. Take you back to the C-sharp days. Let me ask you, do you remember when we said float, and this doesn't have to be in here. Remember this, if I said float num equals 12.2, do you guys remember that would not compile? Wouldn't you have to like put M? Or you had to put F. F yeah. You had to put F here. Why? This would not compile because 12.2 is a double by default. The compiler basically, C sharp sees a float on the left and a double on the right. It's a, you call that a floating point number, it basically means it has a decimal point and, and C sharp has to pick a data type for it, right? So C sharp sees, well, I see 12.2, that could be a double, that could be a float. You gotta pick one, the compiler picks a double. So you got a double on the right, you got a float on the left, that's called a narrowing conversion, which could potentially cause data loss. So they want to say, hey, you basically, they force you to uh, convert. They say, you know what? I know this 12.2 is an F. I know it's a float. I've got a float on the left. I've got a float on the right. I'm not losing data. I know what I'm doing. And that's, that's how C Sharp works, right? If you're going to create a float, okay? All that's just to say this 99 is a double. Now, remember that our value data types such as double. Double is considered to be a value data type. We could do this. We could say double x uh, equals 999. Or we could say double eh, x equals 999. Putting that question mark allows x to be nullable. So our doubles are either nullable or they're not. By default, that line of code right there, you could not, x equals null, would not compile. That would not work. But if I put the little question mark right there, now that code would compile. Okay, so our data types are either nullable or they're not. Okay. So when I just hard code 999, that's a double, but it's not nullable, right? This 999, as the compiler has to determine a data type, the compiler not only picks a double, but it picks a not nullable double. Okay, back to my demonstration. If you want to use this question mark right here, then our data type must be a nullable double. So what this does, this right here converts a non-nullable double into a nullable double so that we can use this question mark. Because without, without making this a nullable double, you, you could not put that question mark there and have it work, okay? So that's a long explanation behind that single line of code, but it basically boils down to this. This 999 is a non-nullable double. Therefore, if you want to use this nullable coalescing operator, right 
And wherever that was, where did I go? Did I jump that far ahead? No. There it is. 12. If you want to use this, then you have to cast your normal double into a nullable double, is what that boils down to. Um, and that, again, other than that, all this is doing is pulling out a single piece of view data instead of having to loop over all the pieces of view data, right? Again, view data is a dictionary, big takeaway there. You know, dictionaries are a little bit different to work with. It's not as easy as working with view bag. Kind of jumping ahead to um, view bag, putting data into view bag is using this dot notation. So view bag is also a property. Both view data is a property, view bag is a property. And they have these, even though these are called properties, they have these dynamic properties that you can create. Okay? Because these properties, the view bag property has a dynamic property called book that has a value of Alice in Wonderland. Again, kind of getting into what we're going to talk about a little bit tomorrow. There's no IntelliSense around this, right? Which gives you runtime errors if you don't code all of this right. Um, this same loop even though we're loading up a view bag remembering that a view bag is actually a part of view data therefore even though we load our view bag up this way we can loop through view data and this will still work right i almost think of it as like view bag is a child if you will a single child of view data so this title of using razor code that uses view data to display view bag properties. Literally, this slide looks exactly the same as before, but the only difference is we would have used view bag to put the data in, and we're using view data to read the data out. Um, and I believe, I believe you guys have used that syntax of reading a single view bag on the way out like that. I think you're right over there. It's good. Passionate. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Um... Because in general, view bag is easier to work with view data, the recommendation is just use view bag. They do give a couple uh, caveats when you would choose to use view data instead of view bag. Okay, so the rule of thumb is to use view bag. Um, and so if you want to use a key name that has spaces, for example, that's one scenario where you might consider view data instead of view bag. Um, if you want to work with the properties and methods of the dictionary, like count or the clear, we talked about those back here, count, uh, property, the keys and the values. So there's some built in, um, methods and properties that you might want to work with, or if you want to loop through all the items in a view data dictionary. Um, but again, for the most part, rule of thumb, you could just use the view bag. Um, okay, I guess one last thing to talk about before we just jump into some code demo. Again, you guys can follow along. It is interesting that when you are using the view data property, that in order to use this two string uh, null coalescing operator, you had to first convert the double into a nullable double, and then you could. 
Um, but that's not the case here when you're using view bag. So the syntax is actually just a lot easier using view bag. Um, so this, this works without the additional um, conv uh, cast out front. So here when we're using view data to read the price, we had to cast it out front and then we could use this null operator. But that's not the case when you're using view bag. You don't have that casting out front into a nullable double. And I highlighted in the book why that was. Uh, da, 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 da. Because the view bag uses view data dictionary, it is often thought of as an alias as view data. That's not it. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, since here it is, since the view bag is dynamically typed, meaning all of these properties are dynamically typed. You don't need to explicitly cast property values to work with the data they contain. Um, and so basically, it's going to be nullable because of that dynamically typed when this thing is running. If you're trying to use this null coalescing operator, it's gonna make it a nullable double. Um, inside of view bag. So there's your answer on page 294, whatever, one, two, whatever, middle of the page. Okay. Um, okay, so let's put this stuff into practice. All right, that's a whole lot of theory uh, or a little bit of theory. And I thought this would be kind of fun to do together because we haven't done images before. So we'll do some images and we're gonna do this NFL Teams app. And so, um, let's just start, if you want to code along, with a new project and ASP.NET Core Web App. I should call junk, I should call it something different, huh? It's junk, huh? It's junk. In other words, I don't need to save it. I'm okay to delete this because it's literally out of uh, out of the book. So we'll just call this Teams. Actually, I'll call this Chapter 8. Chapter 08, NFL Teams. Okay, so um, this NFL Teams app basically is a bunch of logos. It's not CRUD operations, it's just a bunch of read operations and we'll be able to filter teams by their conference and by their division. And so in the models, uh, starts by adding a class in the models that is conference. And so there's basically two conferences uh, in the NFL. Conference ID, get and set. And name, public string name. Uh, 
Okay, so there's a, a NFC and AFC, and those are basically your conferences. Um, we'll see when we generate the database, but this should not like be auto incrementing. It's normally you make it uh, an integer with the identifier ID, but we'll we'll pass in um, we'll pass in strings for both the ID primary key column and the name property. So let's make our next model, add a class called division. Division ID is string empty. Division name, string empty. So we'll just call it name. And IntelliSense is pretty savvy. So there's like the east, west, north, south divisions. And finally, we'll have our teams. So let's add a class called team. Team ID, team name, Now something that's different about this uh, model, you're going to notice there's no foreign key properties. Um, so normally we would have conference ID over here and division ID. Um, but really since we're not doing CRUD operations, we're not having to insert anything new. These are all done with this is basically a read-only application. Um, they chose not to include those since you don't need to like add new teams that have conferences and anything like that. Since it's since it's only reading, uh, you could get by, I guess, without having those what are called foreign key properties. Uh, Vinny, uh, is there a reason why we're doing a string data type for image? Yeah. So at the end of the day, the image um, we're just going to have the file name stored there. So like rams.png. Gotcha. Um, so that's why we're storing that as a string. All right. Let's open up our app settings.json. And let's add a connection string. So we're going to connection strings. Our, our context is going to be called team context. Lots of room for typos here. And so what I might do is just copy it for you. I wish. Okay. Let me... Uh, plop that into Discord. Let's 
get our connection string, and then we also need to modify our program.cs. Just let me do one more double check on this. Team context, local DB, NFL teams, trusted connection of true, active result sets, true, okay. So that's our connection string inside of app settings. Let's open up program.cs and add entity framework core dependency injection. Builder services add DB. Um, one second, let's add a using up at the top. Um, okay, in order to have this using Entity Framework Core, of course, we need to install. Uh, we need to install it. So let's go under Tools, NuGet Package Manager, Manage. Browse Entity Framework Tools Entity Framework Core Tools Install Okay, finished there. Uh, let's go entity SQL Server, Entity Framework Core SQL Server, install. I accept. Go to output, it says finished. And let me just search for Entity Framework and just Entity Framework Core. Just install that one as well. Kind of the same thing we've been doing since chapter four. Go to output, finished. Now, using Microsoft dot entity framework core. And let's also add using uh, using NFL teams dot model. NFL teams is the name of my uh, project, so it's project name dot models. All that allows us to do this builder dot services dot add db context is now there team context we don't have our team context yet so that's not going to work options options use sql server builder configuration get connection string Team context, one, two, three, semicolon. It doesn't know what team context is yet, and our connection stream is called team context, so let's close that. So next up, we'll create our team context file, which will have our seed data. Okay, guys, I'm, I'm just going to continue. I've been waiting. Been waiting, but we got to go. At some point, we got to go. So, we're missing this team context class that's inside of models. Um, and so, let's go ahead and make that add a class team context. Okay. 
and that's going to inherit from db context of course we need to add a using entity framework core here's our constructor three tables so for each table we do a DB set called teams DB set called conferences and divisions Vision called divisions. Divisations. <laughs> Could I? So this basically wires up three tables in our database called conferences, teams, and divisions. And then we seed those tables with a method called on model creating protected override void I'm going to copy the three methods full of seed data into Discord for you guys. So at this point, I'm going to paste this in and we can examine, but basically two conferences, uh, four divisions, and a bunch of teams. So let's go ahead and copy paste there's a it made it a text file message.txt yes Sam sorry about that Josh and so here's your seed data if you open up the message.txt file um, that you can basically copy and paste into basically line my line 18 now you'll notice um, when we create a conference so in the conference table there's two conference objects so new conference new conference new division new division new division so we're creating these objects um, when it comes to creating our teams you notice there's no actual team object here so this is called an anonymous object you know we're just creating a um, an object that doesn't stem from a class and the reason that the they chose to implement using this syntax is um, going back to our team class because there's no conference ID, no division ID. Um, yet, if you look at here, we provide a conference ID and provide a, div a division ID, right? So we can't use that team class essentially to build these out because there is no conference ID, no division ID. 
you know, I, I really don't see the harm in, in doing that if you wanted to create a conference ID and division ID here, but I'm just following the book example where they don't. So for that reason, that's why there's no, there's no new team object here. <clears throat> um, but other than that, there's a team ID, a name, a conference ID, a division ID, and like Vinny said, hey, why is the image in the string? It's because it's just the name of the PNG file. So you paste those three method calls in, and that's going to be our seed data. Mr. G, can I just see the very top of the uh, team context page? Thank you. Okay, and if I'm not forgetting any steps, I think we're ready to add a migration and create this database. So let's go ahead and go to our package manager, add migration initial. Let's see what breaks. If not on mine, then certainly on some of yours. Okay, so it doesn't like team. Oh, team name. Ooh, team. This should just be name. So in my team CS, it's just name, not team name. That would be my mistake. Let's try again. Okay. Now it created our um, migration file called initial. So there it is. And now to run that, update database. Update database. Uh, I already had this once, so I got to delete it and do it again. So, uh, did you guys' work? Yep. yep, good. So, somewhere on mine, NFL Teams, let me delete this, close existing connections so that it's not there. And let me run that command again. And done. And now let's go look here. Let me click on refresh databases, NFL teams, tables. Let's look at conferences and divisions. and teams. And this is very up to date because I think last year Washington was not called the Washington Commanders. I think in 2021 I think they were just called Washington football team, yeah. yeah, and so they are given the new name in this this last this last go around. So we have Washington Commanders. So this is nice and up to date. Um, let's look at the design of this. So view designer. So team ID is a primary key. And there are two foreign key columns, conference and ID and division ID. Even though, it's interesting, even though we didn't put that 
particular property in there and still pick that up. Okay, so we have our data in our database. Um, the next thing is to, if we look inside of our static files, inside of WW root, um, I'm going to give you guys a folder called images full of all the PNG images. Um, and so, let me pause. We'll see if this copy and paste into Discord works or if it, it might be uh, too many things to put inside of Discord. Uh, when I mean too many things, file size too big. We'll see. All right, do me a favor. I put it images.zip inside of Discord. Can you guys tell me if you can access those images? Okay, so download the images.zip. And when you do that, you'll be given an images folder. And inside of that images folder, you'll have all the team images. So what you'll do is you'll copy that, copy that. And if you right click on your project, you can open folder and file explorer. Which brings you here. Again, I'm going to do this again. You're not going to right-click the solution. You're going to right-click the project and open folder and file explorer, which brings you right here. There's WW root. This is where you're going to paste in your images folder. So now there's an images folder inside of WW root with all of our images in it. And now we could use these images. All right, I'm going to close program CS. Program.cs is now recognizing what team context is. We have our team. Close that model, close the model, close the model back to here. I'm going to go into my home controller now and kind of delete the stuff. Here inside of my constructor, I'm going to leave my constructor. I'm going to delete the privacy, delete the error. Right, so get my home controller kind of down to this. bring in our context Okay, so I don't think we've really done anything too different other than the images, bringing the images in. Um, that that uh, hour-long lecture that I covered, here's the first thing that we've done differently, right? View result. Ooh, we've changed our return data type to a view result. Um, we're going to allow for a couple of um, parameters into our index method that we're going to filter by. And so um, we need to update our routing to allow for these <coughs> segments in the URL. So 
So we're going to store a couple pieces of data in view bag. So basically these variables that are coming in, we're going to load that up into our view bag. Same thing, we're going to store all the conferences in view bag and all the divisions. So, view bag conferences. To list. So the, you know, again, um, your interfaces typically have the I uh, convention, so I queryable interface. Um, so any kind of objects that implement I queryable, so anything that you can query, like whatever your data set may be, um, you could implement this I queryable interface. Okay, so we kind of start our query off by selecting all the teams. Like, we're, this is a select star on your teams, just ordering them alphabetically by name. And so we're starting our query off by selecting star. And we say, hey, if active conf not equal to all, Now, something that maybe you learned along the way, maybe maybe I didn't teach, right? If, you, if your if statement is only a single statement, right? You actually don't need curlies. I always included curlies, but it's actually more concise to just kind of tab over and say query equals query dot where. Okay, so let me kind of get this all in one viewable space. So again, because my single statement in my if statement, if you had two statements, you have to have the curlies. Did, did you guys learn that somewhere along the way? I mean, I learned it from when I was doing my own job stuff. Okay, so you've, you've learned it elsewhere. You remember, you remember that? Okay, okay. Sure, sure. So you could add the curlies should you choose, but they're just not mandatory. If active div is not equal to all. So basically, if you're if you're doing any filtering, right? If if these parameters ha are anything else besides all, then you apply these filters. Uh, where the conference ID to lowercase is the active conference to lowercase. So making sure lowercase, lowercase on both sides. Why well, gets back in our C-sharp lab days. All right, uh, query equals query dot where. This is basically the same thing, except for you're doing the division. Division, division ID to lower. Um, this piece right here, 
you think of it as like building the query. But if you remember, it's not until we call to list that we execute the query. So here, let's say teams equals query to list. It's this line executes the query when you call to list. And then we return the teams to the view. Yeah, lines 26 through here is essentially building a query. This is like select star. This is saying, hey, if there's, an, if there's a conference, then filter by the conference. If there's a division, then filter by the division. But it li literally doesn't run the query against the data, uh, the database, until you call this to list method. The next step is to create this custom route that will accept an active conference and an active division. Right? So we're going to go back into our program CS and we're going to add another app.mapcontroller route, not map area controller route, map controller route. Name is custom pattern controller action conf hyphen active conf. in mind that these are dynamic things and curlies so the controller is dynamic the action is dynamic and then static conference dynamic active conference static division active division so there's our custom route All right, let's take a look at our layout file. You guys done with this piece here? Yeah. All right, let's just glance at our layout under views, shared layout. I'll just change the title at view bag dot title. Um, let's chop out a lot of this body. Gonna delete the. Uh, I'm just gonna delete the header. And I'm gonna delete the footer. So we've got a container. Inside the container, I'll put a uh, put the header. Little bootstrap.
okay, just a simple main tag, close the div. So a header with an H1 in it, the main that renders the body. That's basically what we brought that down to. Okay, now we are into the views. So that was the layout. Let's go to the home index and change this to say NFL teams. Again, notice how you're putting the data into view data title, but then here it's view bag title. View bag, yeah. View bag dot title, yeah, that'll work. It's like the That's right. Okay. It, makes more sense in my head. it makes perfect sense in my head, yeah. but again, it just boils down to the the view bag is an alias for view data. Um, I guess you know, just fire this up and. I just want to see that it's not broken at this point. And basically, it's just going to have a title of NFL teams. And okay, so we got the title of NFL teams, NFL teams. Obviously, we got to flush that out. So let's delete this. And there's a little method that I'm going to skip. Um, so I'm going to come back to writing. There's like a little custom method, what they call a helper method. Uh, I'm going to come back to that. Let's set the model here of a, basically a list of teams, um, but I enumerable. And so a list of teams, well, a list implements I enumerable. I enumerable just means you can do a for each over it, right? So anything that you can do a for each over is something that you would implement I enumerable because a list is something you would do a for each over. A list of teams and I enumerable teams, all good. Bootstrap row. And call medium three, div class of call medium nine. Obviously adds up to 12. So three parts, one fourth, and then three quarters parts for this row. Um, let's just go down into the nine part. I'll come back up to the three. Do an unordered list. For each team, team, and model. And IntelliSense is pretty cool. It says go to the root images. And you say at team dot logo image. So the image source is that. The alt is the team name. And the title, which is essentially your tooltip, is the team name followed by a pipe symbol, T 
team conference name team division name. So that's a really fancy uh, tooltip for our images and self-closing image tags. So don't forget your forward slash. But keep in mind the title is basically when you hover over it, that's a tooltip that you get. So our tooltip is going to be the team name followed by the conference and the division that it's in. And I just want to get this for each loop working. And obviously no filtering is going on yet. Let's see if our images come up. There they are. Didn't really check out the uh, tool tip, so let's hover these. Arizona Cardinals, NFC West. NFC South, AFC North, there you, so on and so forth. You're right. Well, that's the nine parts, nine parts of the 12, right? So once we, uh, we add in the other three, it'll be more centered. Yeah. Yep. Right. Sure. Okay. So, um, to kind of just take one step back, you know, this controller is hitting our database. We're selecting all of our teams. And our active conference is coming in as all, and our active division is coming in as all, because these are default values and we haven't changed them. And so these are both all, so neither of these filters are running. So we're basically selecting star and putting that in our, our team's model, and then that team's model is sent into the view, and that view is sent down to the browser. And that view is loading up all of our for each team inside of our model for each team. So we're looping through all of our 32 teams, putting them into an unordered list of inline items until, you know, you run out of space in the container that you're in and that, that causes the, the images to go down a line because you run out of space. And so you could fit so many teams, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, before you run out of room, and then you go down, so on and so forth. Um, so now up here, we're gonna apply some navigation filters to hit this other route. Uh, well, it's all actually, it's all one route, but, um, well, I take that back. There are two routes. Right now it's using this route, but as soon as we start sending in some links to take us to this other route, which is what we have to code next, that will start being our filters. And you did a lab that was kind of similar to this. Um, so let's start here with some margin top on a div, or on an H3, excuse me. So this is going to be the link that says all conferences. And so this active conf route will be set equal to all. So slash active conf, the value of all.
And so if there is an active div, it would be passed in via view bag, which we set back here. If there's an active div, we pass it in. So it's either going to say all or something else. Well, this is what we're doing is we're filtering by conference. So this first link is we're just saying, hey, it's all. List group item is the class. And the link says all. Now again, I'm I'm not really I'm not doing anything with the uh, the active links yet. I'll come back to that. All right, but uh, if I just look at this. This link that's generated takes me to home index conference all division all conf hyphen all div hyphen all. I believe that is correct. And if in fact clicking that gives you the same results, which is which is right, but it doesn't break, which is an important piece, right? Conference of all division all. And again, just kind of looking at our route here, conf hyphen all div hyphen all. So it's hitting that new route and it's not breaking. Um, after my all link, then I'm just gonna loop over all of my conferences for each conference conf in view bag conferences generate another link for each one of these So we're looping through all the conferences, printing out a link that takes you to the conference ID. The, we're only changing the conferences here. So again, the, the active div is coming from view bag, just like it was up here. Classes list group item. And then what that link will say is conference name at conf dot name. And launch that. That should give us a few more links. Notice It'll change conference down below to NFC and AFC. The division will still say all. And that's getting those filtering, those filters going. We're not doing anything with the active links yet, but we are filtering by conference now.
So still inside the call medium three div, but after the list group. So it's kind of, it's in between these two closing divs right here in between those two. We'll have another H3. And this will say division. Again, the, the link, the first link will be all, so it'll be basically the same thing as above, except for you're, you're kind of swapping uh, these two pieces. So A, ASP route active comp equals, and that comes from view bag. div says all so if there is an active conference you're still filtering by that conference but your division will change to all class list group item and the link says all so our first link is all Just see what that looks like. So now we've got division with all, conference all, division all. So if we filter by NFC, it'll say conference NFC, division all. That's looking good. AFC, division all. Okay, so that's working. So there's our division. Just like before, we had a for each loop, so let's have another for each loop. For each division div in view bag divisions. Let's make a link for each one. So the conference comes from view bag, the active div comes from the div dot division ID. Put these on different lines because I think that that worked out all right. And the class of list group item at div dot name. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, you know what I forgot? Just like up here, I had a div called list group. I forgot my div called list list group. Div class of list hyphen group. Close that div. And then close that div there. So then this would be tabbed over. Just like it was here. H3 div. That's good. H3 div. Then close that div, which is the call medium three. And then opens up the call medium nine. So I just added, if you're following closely, I just added line 19 and line 27. Okay, so now we get conference to say all. And now we get to, to say division east, north, south, west, NFC, AFC, all, all. And everything's working besides active links, right? Which is the last piece of this. Last piece of this is just to highlight the links that you've clicked on with um, with a bootstrap class of active on the on the link. And so I mentioned this earlier, but the the way the book uh, covers this is with a little helper method. So up here, we're gonna define a method in this code block, in this razor code block, we're gonna define a method. The method returns a string. The method is called active. And it takes in two parameters. And it's gonna return Okay, so it takes in a uh, filter, so it's going to say filter to lower. Does that equal selected to lower? If so, add the class of active. Otherwise, don't. So again, this is basically making a private method called active. It takes in two strings. You basically see if those two strings are equal, if those two strings are equal, you add the class of active, otherwise you don't. Um, yeah, because it's C-sharp, okay. so, yep. Can you explain that one more time? Sure. So what you what you normally do is you have like a private string active, right? But it's not necessary here. So we have a a method called active, and it returns a string. And there's two inputs to that method, um, which are both strings. And so we're gonna pass two strings into this method when we call the method. Obviously, we haven't called it yet. Um, and it either returns the word active, which we're, we're gonna apply to a bootstrap class, or, or nothing. So if the two strings are equal, then it's gonna add the class of active. If the two strings aren't equal, then you don't add anything. You add an empty string. So it either returns active or empty string. If you did that in, in the layout, would you be able to just call it here? If you, yeah, we're gonna call it in the layout. Um, Oh, um, so I'm not sure, like, like essentially you're saying, hey, if I made the, the razor, if we made the method here, could I call it there? I don't know. It's a good question. Uh, I'd have to try it out and maybe we can. Um, but let's, let's call it, let's call it from here. So, right, because in other words, you wouldn't have to replicate this three or four times or whatever. Right, because isn't that what kind of, with the previous lab we did, there was like a bat header, is that? Yeah, a similar thing. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so let's call this method. So where this is called is on our links, right? So here's our first link. Let's go to our classes. And inside of our class list, let's put a space right here. And we're going to call active. Um, pass in the word all and pass in <clears throat> view bag dot active conference. So this is our method call. We're passing in the string of all. And if that's considered our active conference, which again, that, that was set in our controller, then that adds the class of active on this link. So let's see if that works. And we'll basically change our link to blue. And there, there it goes. Since this is by default, all is our active conference, those two strings are equal. Because those two strings are equal, it puts the active class on our link. We're about to do that. Well, you're going to have to do it at least once in the loop. Okay. Right? So. So let's good, kind of do the same thing here, at active. And we pass in two strings, the conference ID, conf dot conference ID, comma, and then the view bag active conference. So now that's working. Obviously, we got to get that going on division. <laughs> Try and demonstrate like this view bag you know, active div, capital A, capital D, you know, that's ultimately set right here. And so here's an example of using view bags, setting some data into it. Here's an example of using, reading data out. I just am curious if, what if I, what if I did a lowercase a? Okay, not breaking. Let's just say active, maybe I put an S. I'm trying to get this to break. So it's not even breaking gracefully. Um, but you'll notice my routes break because here everything's done in segments and all of a sudden now it's being done in a query string right so whether my filtering is actually working it might still be it kind of does look like my filtering is working here um, but actually here's NFC teams So surprisingly, it's, my app is still working, but my, my routing is seemingly broke here. Anyways, no IntelliSense, so these kinds of problems, even though that didn't seem so, so severe. Um, kind of what I was talking about earlier. There's no IntelliSense on ViewBag. 
All right, so now we got to apply active over here. So here's my class. Let's call active. There's my method call. Uh, all is the first argument. View bag dot active. And so fire that up. Okay, that's working there. And finally, the last place we call active is right here. Active div division ID comma view bag active div. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. So, even with that active uh, method, like, it's inferring like that gross value that we're passing in our string, you know? We don't have to tell it anywhere right there. So I guess it's going back to the controller. Well, I guess right there, we're telling it it's taken in strings. For the we're telling it it's taken in strings, yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, well, we, we pass in, like, some of these, like, on um, uh, our all, like, we are hard coding a string going in. And then, ultimately, active conf is a string that comes from active conf right here, which is, ultimately, active conf, there's your string right there. And then, only if your link, you know, only if active conf is set to something else because of the the route like here if we set active conf to afc you can kind of see in the lower left hand corner conf hyphen afc that's again that's your string the hyphen afc which is right here so that's a string that's being passed in as a string so yeah yeah so can you show Yep. Yep. So notice right here is part of the conf hyphen AFC. That was the link that we, we clicked, yep. right? So conf hyphen AFC. So what happens is active conf will be set equal to AFC. So let me put a breakpoint in right here. Okay. And so I'm going to put a breakpoint in. And you'll see that active conference is basically being passed from the URL into, instead of saying all, let me click on AFC. Now notice the variable active conf, see how it says AFC. So that's being active conf is coming from the URL, coming in as AFC. That's being set view bag that active conf equals AFC. until you click on that link that we generated to set the active conf hyphen AFC. Answer your question? Awesome. Yeah, so these kind of parameters are sent in, the data is sent in from the URL to override the defaults of all in all. Active div is still all because we didn't change that. This is loading up in view bag all the conferences and all the divisions. Yeah. If, if that's not so much of a question as in, 
How would you implement the, uh, I forgot what it's called, but having your custom routes like above the controller? Yeah. The uh, attributes. Yeah. So we set our routes inside of here, which is kind of setting it for the whole application. If you just wanted to set it at the controller, um, you would just go right here and do a route um, like this. Um, yes, there's another way of doing it, but you, you still do. Yeah. Maybe it wants double quotes here. I'm not sure. There you go. So yeah, you could, you could set that out that way and do route kind of like that. And then I believe you could comment this out. And nothing should break. Famous last words. There you go. That's a good point. I was wondering if there was, if you could use them kind of in tandem. Yeah. With each other. Um, uh, huh, huh, huh. There you go. So now, now it doesn't show the controller in the route. So, no, you're right. You're right. You don't need that. Makes a nicer URL. Okay, that's a good stopping point for this portion. Tomorrow we've got version two of this. Yeah.